Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were yet sinners, while we were still trapped in our sin, while we were still stuck in our sin, Christ died for us. That is what we hear about. The God of heaven, the creator of the entire universe, stepped down from heaven and came and lived among us, even though he knows the human heart, he knows our human condition, and it did not keep him away. Instead, he came to live amongst us, to show us the way of relationship back to the Father, and he chose willingly of his choice to take our sins and die in our place. But as we just sang about this morning, death did not have the final word. Death could not hold him in the grave because he was sinless in every way. So happy Easter. That is why we are here to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. This is such a beautiful time when churches around the world are celebrating what Jesus did. For you and I. And if this is your first time to River City Church, we want to say a special welcome and a special thank you for being with us on this Easter morning. We're really glad you're here. And and we think it's a great time to, to come to church on Easter, right? We think it's a great time because throughout the year, when we are here gathered on Sunday mornings and in smaller gatherings throughout the week, we, we come around this book called the Bible and, and we look at what it teaches us and shows us. And we, we, with the help of the Holy Spirit, form our lives around the very teachings of Jesus. But the whole entire narrative of the book, the Bible, all the books point to this event that we celebrate today. It points to the point that Jesus is, was crucified on a cross. He was buried, but the best news is he rose again. And that's the reason we're here. And that's the reason we're celebrating. So we're so glad you're here. So here we are on Easter. And as a pastor, believe it or not, um, we do prepare for our messages in advance, right? All right, we, and, and so every year, Easter and Christmas come, and we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. I was even talking to a few pastor friends this week of mine, and like talking about the stress, the pressure, you know, all these ideas. Is Easter and Christmas, you guys know what we're going to preach about. But yet we put this burden on ourselves. We got to come at a new angle. We got to come with creativity. We got to tell you something you never heard before and all this. But the truth of the matter is I could just read this, the account that Jesus died for our sins. And that is enough that he took our place. So about a month ago, I came across this image somehow on my, on an email or something right there. And maybe even more than a month ago, and I was just like, I was drawn to it for some reason. This idea of this this crown of thorns and a king's crown blended together, mixed together. And I was like, I want that to be our Easter image for this year. I wasn't quite sure what, what was all going on with that, but I know that that's our theme for this year. So I want to go back to our key verse, Romans 5, 8, where it says while we were sinners, because we're going to continue to celebrate some more. But before we celebrate, because I want to make sure everybody's on the same page, I got to tell you the bad news before I can tell you all the good news. So you can celebrate the good news, because if we don't understand the bad news, we don't understand why this, why, why, why this is so important when it says that while we were sinners. So before we celebrate, I need to talk to you about this thing called sin, Guys are like, Damien, it's Easter. What are you doing? No, if we want to celebrate, if we want to get excited about what Jesus did and how he took our sins, we got to have a a, a working understanding of what sin is to fully celebrate what Jesus did for us. So no matter if you are a Bible-reading, Christian-going person, or you are here simply because it's Easter, and you know at lunch this afternoon, the family's going to ask you, did you go to service? And you just want to say, yes, I went to church, right? And so whatever, wherever you are on that, wherever you are on this belief of Jesus and the Bible and all of this, we all can look at our world around us, and we can say, there's, there's some things that are just not right, we look at things in our experiences, things that we've experienced, things that we experience around us, things that happen in our world. We look at the greater world and we go, man, there's so much hurt. There's hardship. There's pain. 
We go, why is this happening? Because there's something inside each one of us that goes, this is not the way it's meant to be. This is not the way it was meant to be. There's something off. And for us Bible readers, it starts in the book of Genesis that we see when God created this beautiful world. He looks down and he creates this beautiful place. Beautiful, everything that that is just just wonderful. He actually says after he creates everything, it is good, it is good. And he creates Adam and Eve in the garden. And he's made, made in their very image of God. And he says, they are good. So God has this perfect garden for these perfect couple to be in. There were no thorns, there were no weeds, there was no poor soil. And that's where we were made to live. That's where we were intended to live. We, that's why each one of us has this, this, this desire inside of us to experience good that knows when something is not right. We have this longing for a home that we've never been in. Have you ever sensed that? You have this longing for this place that you've never been Because what happens not far into the story in Genesis 3, we read that Adam and Eve, by their own will, their own choice, decided to go against what God said, God's perfect plan, God's God's direction. They bestows their will over his will, otherwise known as sin. They sinned. And so God had, they had, they could no longer live in this garden that God had prepared for them. Because in this garden was one tree that they were not supposed to eat of knowledge of good and evil. And then there's another tree, the tree of life. And God knew that if they were to eat of the tree of life, that they would live forever in their fallen state. So out of love, he sends them away from the garden because he doesn't want them to stay. He does not want us to stay in that fallen state forever. But that day, that very beginning day, God puts together a rescue plan. And he plans one day, he himself, to come and redeem mankind. But before that, Genesis 3, we read this, says, Genesis 3, after they had done this, this, this curse comes on the land. So God says this, says, so I will put a curse on the ground. The ground will produce thorns and weeds for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. So from the very beginning, because of sin, the consequence of sin, the image of sin, the, the result of sin, we see thorns. We see thorns. And then from then on, we see a struggle with trying to, to get the ground to produce food for us. So this spring, as you start working in your yard and every time you get pricked by a thorn in some kind of way, I want you to remember that that is the consequence of sin. They were not intended to be there, but it's a consequence of sin. And then throughout scripture, in fact, over 50 times in my study, I came across 50 verses symbolize thorns as a result of sin, disobedience, the consequence of sin, of thorns. For one example, Proverbs 22, verse 5 says this, corrupt people walk a thorny path, treacherous road. Whoever values life will avoid it. He says, there's a thorny path. There's this, this path that, that, that pulls you in. And, you know, at first it's, it's like, I mean, it, if we're honest, sin, temptation, all that, and pl- seeking pleasure, it's good at first. It's fun at first. You're exciting at first. It, you enjoy it at first. But then before long, you find yourself caught in the thorn, wrapped up in it, entangled in it, and cannot get out. You're trapped in that thing that allured you away. Have you ever been trapped in thorns? You ever been trapped? <laughs> it's horrible, right? I remember as a kid, not far from our house, there was this like wild blueberry patch that me and my brother used to go to in, 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 in the springtime and, and get, some, get some blueberries. And I remember my brother saying, hey, look, look inside there. Nobody's been in there. Look at all those ones in there. And so he helps me to maneuver and I'm climbing up under getting these blueberries until I'm completely like surrounded by thorns and thistles and everywhere to the point that I'm pretty sure I started crying because I was a big baby and getting poked and and all this stuff. Then my brother had to go back to the house and get some hedge trimmers to be able to get me out. Thorns, you're lured by that fruit, (laughs) but then you're trapped. And so we read throughout the Bible this idea that thorns representing the consequence of sin. Thorns represent the consequence of sin. But Jesus is in heaven and he sees our struggle with sin, with thorns and the consequence of sin. And Philippians 2 verse 6 and 7 says this, though he was God, he did not consider equality with God 
as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. See, this is what we got to understand is Jesus is in heaven, was in heaven. He was in heaven there with all of the divine privileges of God. He was there at the creation. He was there helping God create this world. And he is wearing a crown in heaven and he takes it off. He removes his rightful position and sets it aside so that he can come and live amongst us. Incredible. Then he comes amongst us and he continues to talk about thorns. He shares in a few different stories and parables. And one, he tells this parable of the, of the sower, right? The farmer that's spreading some seed. And then he talks about that where he describes these seeds and some of them fell on the, the road and some fell on good soil and some fell on a thorny area. And the thorns deprived this seed from growing. It, it's, it's robbed its sunlight and choked them out. He goes on to say that this, this thorny path is described as a person whose heart receives the message of the gospel, who receives this, this thing of Jesus is the son of God. But then the thorns of busyness, the thorns of, of, of worry and distraction and duty come and choke out their lives and choke out that very seed that was planted. So Jesus is talking about thorns over and over throughout his, his time. And then thorns reach their climax in scripture with the very crown of thorns, the crucifixion of Jesus. We read in John 19, up until this point, Jesus had been having a great following. He had his disciples with him. He's in the garden of Gethsemane praying. Judas, who was one of his disciples, comes and betrays him, actually kisses him and betrays him to these Roman, to, to these to these soldiers that come and arrest him. They arrest him. They take him away. They take him through this process of, of counterfeit series of trials. He ends up before Pilate, who's ruling as, a, as an arm of Rome in Jerusalem at this time. And Pilate desperately wants to set Jesus free and says he's not guilty, but he's more worried about the mob. He's more worried about people pleasing. So he sends Jesus to be crucified. And this is what we read in John 19. It says, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him with a purple robe and went and went up to him again and again saying, hail king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. The thorns that cursed the ground, the thorns that were a representation of sin are now placed on Jesus. The one that once wore a crown in heaven now has a crown of thorns put on him. Some unnamed soldier takes a branch, mature enough to have spikes on it, but yet, but yet nimble enough to bend into some kind of circular thing to put around Jesus' head, and they put a robe on him, and they put a reed in his hand, and they mock him and make fun of him, and they think, oh, this is just some heretic. This is some crazy man. And they lead him to the cross to die. But this soldier, we don't even know his name. I could imagine in that moment, he thinks he's just going with the moment. He thinks he's just being humorous. He thinks he's just mocking another person to be crucified. He's not realizing what he's doing and what it represents. That this crown of thorns that was not fashioned by a silversmith, that was not fashioned by some genius master craftsman. No, it was put together by the rough hands of a Roman soldier. It was not placed on Jesus' head with pomp and ceremony. No, it was placed on his head with mockery and blasphemy. And Jesus, who was once in heaven crowned, now has the crown of thorns on his head that represent sin from the beginning. We're going, hold on, hold on. We just said, he that knew no sin. Now sin is being put upon him. Exactly, precisely. He took the sin and he bore it. And he became the substitute. Thorns that should have been mine. 
A thorn of crowns that should have been placed on my head and shoved into my brow. Because just like Adam and Eve, I have chosen my own way. I have rebelled against God. I have just done what I think is right in my eyes and not what God is saying is right. But God says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He who knew no sin. And all the wrath of God against sin was placed on Jesus. We need to understand what we're talking about when we say Jesus bore our sins. That Jesus, the one that was exalted up in heaven, above all sinless, you know, he's, if we got a picture of heaven of what he left and he looks down on our misshapen, malformed, sinful selves and Jesus does not turn away. He doesn't just love us from a distance. He comes and lives among us and he takes our place for our sins and he receives us. And he took the crown of thorns. Yes, physically, and they hurt. Painfully, they were hurt on his head. But Jesus took the curse of sin upon himself. The curse that was my personal sin upon himself. And on the cross, Jesus stretched out his hand and embraced every single one of us. The crown of thorns means to us today that heaven will go to any length to bring you back to the Father's love, to build that relationship again, right? The most amazing thing about the crown of thorns is that this crown belongs to me. I deserve to wear this crown. I deserve to have this crown thrust upon me. I deserve to feel the blood run down my forehead. I deserve the agony, but Christ took my crown of thorns and he gave me a crown of glory. I thought someone was going to help me preach here this morning. I thought you guys wanted to celebrate Easter this morning, right? My Lord so dearly loved the guilty one. and He took my place so that I may go free. He paid my debt. He took my place that I may live. What an exchange. He takes this crown of thorns and then he gives me his crown of life. He took my crown and gives me the crown of life. He took my sin and he gave me his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For God made him, for God has made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What an exchange. What amazing love. What an amazing savior. The crown. So it speaks of what he did, but it also speaks of anticipation. The crowns speak of anticipation. They speak of what is yet to come. See, there is a day coming. Just as we sang this morning, the head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. A day is coming. See, long ago, Jesus wore that crown of thorns. But we as believers look look forward to this glorious day when Jesus will wear another crown. He will wear the crown of glory. In fact, we're told that he will wear many crowns. Look at Revelation 19, 12 says this. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. Listen, guys, the first time Jesus came into Jerusalem, he rode a donkey. The next time Jesus comes in Jerusalem, he's riding a white stallion. The first time he came, he was judged by man. The second time he's coming, he's coming to judge man. The first time he came, he was a lamb. The next time he's coming as a lion. The first time he came, he wore a crown of thorns. The next time he's wearing a crown of victory. Let the crown remind you that he will never wear that crown again. He will never wear it again. Today he is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven and all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. And one day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. The crown also speaks of who we are. Of who we are. Jesus willingly wore that crown, suffered unimaginably. The thorns that he created, he was also the remedy for. 
And if we were to ask Jesus again, why would you do this? Why would you do this? And I believe Jesus and our heavenly father would look at us and say, I'm doing it for you. Second Corinthians, one more time. I got to read it again. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. See, God so desires to pull each one of us away from the sin that so easily entangles us and traps us and fools us and robs our identity and steals joy and steals peace and steals life. He wants so much. And so he's calling you and he's saying, will you give up your thorns? Will you give up your sin? Will you give up your thorns? And will you take this crown of righteousness? You see, one crown is the infection. The other crown is the cure. One says do. This says done. The thorn thorn says bondage. This says you are free because of the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus paid it all. He paid it all for you, for me. See, Jesus, we need to remember this. It was his, he knew where he was going. He willingly gave up his life. He was not tricked by Judas. He was not trapped by those Roman soldiers. He knew he was fulfilling prophecy that was written throughout the narrative of the Bible. He willingly took that crown of thorns. He willingly went to the cross. He died on that cross and he was laid in a buried, borrowed tomb for three days. And three days later, he rose again. And he got up and rolled his own stone away. That's our Jesus. So why does this matter today? Why does it matter? Why do we get so excited about this this man in Israel 2,000 years ago? Why do we get so excited? Because we're told this is how we're made right with God. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 3.22. We are made right with God. This is New Living Translation. I love how simple it puts it. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. No matter who we are. No matter who we are, as long as we believe. So how are you made right with God? By placing our faith in Jesus Christ. How are we made right with God? By placing our faith with Jesus Christ. Notice what it does not say. It does not say you are made right by doing good. It does not say you are made right by not doing bad. It doesn't say you are made right by not yelling and cussing in traffic in Chicago. That's not how it is. You are made right by not yelling at your kids on Easter morning saying, come on guys, we're in the car. We got to get there. We're going to worship Jesus, right? That's not what makes you good. That's not what saves you. Yeah, I saw some of you guys looking at your family. Yeah, we know. That's why I drive separate to church. Um, (laughs) This is true for everyone. No matter who you are, don't miss this. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, no matter where you've been, no matter how messed up your life is right now, no matter how many people you've hurt, no matter how many people have hurt you, no matter how many times you've sinned, God is giving you this gift. He's made Jesus this perfect gift, and he took the penalty for our price of our sins. This is the difference between religion and and relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus did not come to start a new religion. He came to start a relationship with you. He came to offer eternal love. He came to show us the love of our Father. He came to to perform what only he could do. See, religion says perform. Relationship says Jesus already performed it. Religion says work hard enough and maybe God will love you. Relationship says, God loves me. I want to obey him because he's so good. Religion says, it's all up to you. Relationship says, Jesus already did it. So, question is for everyone in the room, is where do you stand with Jesus? You got to do something with Jesus. Because even outside the Bible, history tells us, history tells us that this man lived 
in Jerusalem, he had a great following, and that he was crucified on a tree. Now, what the Bible, the New Testament tells us is that he claimed to be the son of God and that he is the only way to the father and that this guy predicts his own death and resurrection and he pulls it off. So I go with what that guy says, right? Because that is amazing. And he showed us what God is like. And Jesus came and live among us, not for those that got it all together, not that those that are perfect, but he came for each one of us. So Jesus paid it all. And salvation is freely mine and forgiveness alone. Not because of my merit, not because of my perfect obedience. He took the thorns. He took it, what I deserved, buried in a tomb. And that's why we point to the cross here all the time. Because there is room for so many more of you. Would you guys do me a favor on this Easter morning? Would you guys bow your head, close your eyes? We're going to take a moment and reflect and worship, remembering this great sacrifice. But first, some of you in this room, you, you are a church person. This isn't, this isn't your first Easter. This isn't your first rodeo. Maybe you even came through the Explore God series and you're like, okay, I, I get this. I, I get that Jesus is who he says he is. But if you're really honest, it's, it's more of a head thing than a heart thing. You, you can logically think it through. You can all this stuff, but you haven't accepted him into your heart. So uh, for you, I'm praying that you would just allow Jesus to move 18 inches, <laughs> to move from your head to your heart. And if I promise, if you do that, you'll never be the same. Others of you, you're not so much a church person. You're here because it's Easter. You're here because whatever it might be. And, and you're kind of going, wow, I've been in church and lightning hasn't struck yet. Like I made it. Like it sounds like they're almost done and I've, and I've survived. Because you think you're, you, you, you carry such guilt, such shame, such like, I, do I even belong here? But yet at the same time, mysteriously in your heart, you're kind of drawn. Like, going, what is these people so excited about? And there's something tugging you. That is the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit's loving kindness is what draws us to God. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do right now. He wants to reach out to you and say, would you come with your doubts, with your questions, and just, just start to believe. Just say, I, I want to believe this. And if you make this step of saying, God, I want to I believe in your son, I promise you, you will look back at this day and say that Easter years ago is when my, I walked in one way and I left another way. Forever changed. Not a, not, a, not a better version of you, a new you. He wants to take care of that weight of sin that you feel, that guilt. And you can leave brand new. So if either one of those are you and Every eye is closed. Every head is bowed. If you just let me know, just by a little motion of your hand, I'm saying, I'm, I'm praying with you, Damien. I'm praying with you. I, I want, I need the grace of God. I need his forgiveness. I need his righteousness. Would you guys all pray this with me together so no one feels left out or on point? So here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, Forgive me of my sins. Give me your life. Give me your righteousness. And take my thorns. Take my sin. Thank you for the new life you give me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.